A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Over this next hour, you might want to lean in a little closer to the radio so you don't miss some of the finer points as we get some insight into what is happening by way of shaping the values. And we're going to zero in on New South Wales, but the values of a whole nation are at risk with some of the movements that are happening in our state parliaments around Australia. You may have been following the developments in New South Wales where Alex Greenwich, the independent member for Sydney, has introduced a second bill that would undermine religious freedom in New South Wales. He's called it the Equality Bill, and if it passes, it would have wide-ranging ramifications. It would slash religious protections for churches and schools. It would allow people over 16 to change their sex on their birth certificate at any time, and it would allow children to bypass their parents to get medical treatment, including puberty blockers. Well, the New South Wales Parliament has, in my understanding, just voted to delay the debate. But a vote is still expected on the 14th of March. Mike Southon is Executive Director of the organisation called Freedom for Faith. Mike is our guest through this coming hour. Mike, a special welcome back to 2020. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, Mike, just clarify for us, uh, the bill uh, has been introduced and there's been a motion yesterday just to delay the debate. Uh, Give us your background here because I suspect listeners uh, will not know just how significant it is that there might be a delay and that might actually be good news. But but where are we at on this? Yeah, so... The bill was actually originally introduced at the same time as conversion therapy, and it's been, it was sitting around for a while with everyone expecting it not to go anywhere. And the last minutes, effectively, of last year's parliament, uh, the government voted to give the bill a new life, stop it from expiring at the end of the year, and they voted to ensure that it gets debated on the 8th of February and ensure that it gets voted on in time for the 14th of March. So those are the two dates that they put in at the end of last year. So in my understanding, the conversion therapy bill, uh, as that was halted in the parliament, uh, then this has been picked up to take things, and you might even say even deeper, around some of those sorts of issues. Um, There was a campaign that you were organising around conversion therapy that really did demonstrate the power of writing to MPs. What happened with that campaign? Yeah, thousands of people uh, wrote to their MP. We we had a website to help you write. It was contactyourmp.org.au. And uh, we were asking, and everyone who was writing was asking, don't use Alex Greenwich's conversion therapy legislation. Labor did commit that they would bring in conversion therapy legislation, but we've been asking them to write their own And we were asking a bunch of things for them to do, like not ban prayer, not ban preaching, not ban people, asking for the sort of support that they want to ask for consensually. And the result of the the email campaign was that Labor listened. They didn't advance Alex Greenwich's bill, and it has expired at the end of last year. And they are writing their own legislation, and they are consulting and negotiating with faith communities. So that's really good news. It does show, as you said, that when we work together and lots of us speak out, they do listen. So there was a win, and uh, yeah. this is encouraging because undoubtedly uh, some of the listeners to our conversation today would have participated in that. No doubt there's more opportunity to participate because just because there is a win and one bill goes by the wayside, doesn't get up, well, here's an instance where another one follows hot on its heels and the provisions in that bill, some of those things that are being Uh, proposed uh, could be actually even more sinister than the conversion therapy uh, bill. Uh, Just give us an oversight of this particular equality bill. As I understand it, it's like 50 pages. So uh, someone like yourself, Mike, you've probably got the uh, the capacity to go through there. Lots of us would, uh, you know, be be going to sleep on the second page, but it's a 50-page bill. Uh, Describe it for us. Yeah, so 50 pages, it um, makes 80 different changes to 20 bits of legislation. It's called an omnibus bill in that it tries to do everything all in one hit. Good legislation, if you want to solve a problem, you write 
a piece of legislation that's four or five pages long to fix a problem and you and you consult on it. But this is just a massive set of changes doing a whole lot of things, which the uh, it, it's even hard to figure out why all these ideas are connected in the one bill. And I can tell you the one thing it's not interested in is equality. Uh, so there's something deceptive, even in the name of the bill. I guess the first thing you have to know as a Christian believer, as soon as somebody says equality, that's not a good word. It can be a good word. It can be a, a misused word. Yeah, and absolutely in this case, it's uh, equality means the advancement of the, the desires of a small minority of people. Uh, and explicitly over and above the the needs of a majority of people, and especially women. This bill is really bad for women. We might get into that and uh, enlarge on what the significance is for women. But this equality bill, as you say, it actually has been around for a long time. Uh, You thought it was dead in the water. In fact, uh, there had been delays that had come from the New South Wales Parliament and looked like it was just on hold, on ice, for an extended period. And then late last year, uh, what happened that this all of a sudden became live again? Uh, in, at one thirty in the morning on a late sitting um, night, uh, the government moved just a small procedural motion which stopped the bill from expiring. Uh, at the end of this of last year, it should just have expired by the due course of how Parliament works. But they moved a little motion that stopped it from expiring and gave it a lease of life. It expires officially now on the 15th of March. Uh, and it has this procedural motion also said that if nothing else, even if no debate has happened by the 14th of March, there will be a vote. So where does the Labor government, Premier Chris Minns, where does he sit? And you might have your own reflection too on where the opposition is at, uh, opposition leader Mark Speakman. Where are they sitting on this bill? Well, the the opposition have told us and have um, responded to people who have been writing to them in the past day or so saying that they oppose the bill in its current form, which is is a comforting position. Uh, It gets honestly less comforting if the bill might get amended. We don't know whether they would change their view. But the and the current the, the government, New South Wales government, have not given us their position. I've talked to individual MPs who are not supportive of the bill, but that we don't have a formal position from the government at this stage, which is actually the explanation of why there wasn't a debate yesterday. So the debate didn't happen yesterday, quite clearly, because the government didn't know what they wanted to say about this bill. And is the government, do you think, uh, preparing now to be able to address these issues, given that there is still a vote, uh, 14th of March, that this could happen? Because uh, it would seem to be, if the government's not prepared, uh, that's a very quick time between now and 14th of March. Any any thoughts here about, uh, what, is the government scrambling to uh, to find a position on this, do you think? No, I don't think they're scrambling. Uh, I don't feel that they feel like they're under pressure to come to a decision quickly. I think what they're feeling is that over the past three to four weeks, a lot of people from faith communities have started writing to them about how concerned they are about this bill. And they've started to pick up this realisation that this bill is as bad as the conversion therapy bill. And that means they need to take their time to think about it. So I actually see the pause as a very positive thing. They could have just had a debate yesterday and had a knee-jerk reaction, but it feels like they're stopping and thinking. Okay, there might be something positive in that. Come back to the opposition again. Uh, Opposition leader Mark Speakman and uh, the Liberal Nationals in New South Wales. Are they likely to take a real opposition view and oppose uh, this sort of thing uh, if the government uh, looks like they're moving forward? Uh, I guess I'm I'm asking you to to say here, uh, you know, uh, where do you think the opposition is on this? Because so often when these sorts of things are going through our parliaments, uh, we've got a very weak and silent opposition just going along with the flow. That, that has always been a problem. Um, in either party has been in government over the past decade. There's been no real opposition on issues around this. 
this is why it's so important that we're also talking to our, our Liberal and National MPs over the next month so that they know what their constituents care about and that they're very worried. Now, we do know that um, MPs of both sides have been receiving, uh, have started to receive uh, a good amount of emails and they're starting to notice. The opposition have said they oppose the bill as in its current form. Uh, we just want to encourage the opposition and the government to oppose the bill full stop. Just do not pass this bill. If you want to write your own legislation about things, go ahead and write your own legislation, as I said, issue by issue. But just oppose this bill and then start thinking about what you want to do yourself. Mike, let's come to your organisation. You're leading Freedom for Faith. And uh, for a lot of years now, uh, Freedom for Faith has been there on the cutting edge and looking at that legislation and looking at Christian viewpoints and how things sit uh, with our faith and where the churches are on all of this. Uh, Give us a little insight here into Freedom for Faith and the sort of work that you do. And then I'm going to invite listeners to participate in our conversation. There might be questions and comments. There might even be critiques. But uh, your thoughts on on what Freedom for Faith has been doing, the work that you're involved in. Uh, Essentially, the role of Freedom for Faith is to serve the church and help the church to uh, activate, to protect its own religious freedom. Uh, We don't think it's our mission. We think it's the church's mission and the individual Christian's mission, and we exist to serve and to help um, help them do that. So that looks like predominantly providing our legal thinking and our resources. And so we're just putting in quite a large submission to the Productivity Commission about tax deductibility. That's a different issue entirely, supported by a whole no- bunch of major denominations. It also looks like us resourcing you on the ground, churches and individuals, to speak to your government in a way that is heard and that is effective. And as you said, we've had some good success in New South Wales on conversion therapy. We've made the government stop and pause and talk to us and think about good legislation. It seems to be working as well on um, Alex Greenwich's equality bill. It has made people pause and think and slow the debate down. We're going to have conversations in Queensland and Western uh, Western Australia uh, within this next year, I'm sure, uh, particularly in Western Australia on conversion therapy, Tasmania on conversion therapy, and we want to help the church across Australia to speak out well. Mike, the other states around Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, uh, what other states are doing, uh, considering all sorts of dimensions around these sorts of issues we're talking about? Well, pretty much every state, to be honest, is is something going on. Uh, In places like Victoria and Queensland, conversion therapy legislation has already been passed, which is doing damage, and we need to to fix this legislation. In Western Australia, the conversation has started and the government is feeling under pressure to bring legislation, and we need to start talking to them effectively as a church, saying we're very concerned about this. In Tasmania legislation has draft legislation has been released and uh, and that is under discussion and and that's actually a bit more encouraging because that legislation is uh, far less intrusive than say victoria's model uh, every state feels the pressure to bring conversion therapy legislation these other uh, amendments that the equality bill brings in such as changing your sex on your birth certificate such as um Uh, being able to, uh, whether faith institutions can employ based on faith, Northern Territory is already legislated on that. So it's everywhere. Okay, Uh, let's talk through some of the issues that are at hand. And while we're a little bit off topic here, uh, and we'll come back onto topic quickly, but a quick comment from you, because uh, Productivity Commission is also uh, talking about the uh, DGR, the way that churches yes. are dealing with some taxation issues. There's some good tax allowances for uh, churches, for religious organisations. This is a whole other dimension that we can have a bigger, longer conversation on another day. But this is another thing that's happening behind the scenes. A quick comment here before we come back to some of these things uh, in New South Wales. Yeah, my briefest comment on the Productivity Commission, submissions are due today. So there's not much people can do right now. Uh It is a Productivity Commission report. It's not a government policy. So it's a long way before it becomes policy. But we need to respond very firmly to it at this point. 
they it's heavily biased against religion and it's been very clearly heavily biased against religion and where our efforts are going to be convincing the government to reject this report uh, and re particularly reject the recommendations it has where it treats other charities completely different to faith-based charities and instead understand the value of faith-based organisations in our society. So that's going to be a, an ongoing conversation. I think we're going to see it rolling for the next 12 months. Some people think there's an inevitability about how some of these biases come against faith-based religious charities and churches. Um, what's your view here? I, I often think uh, we ought to have an optimistic view that these things can be contained and even uh, changed back to a favourable position on churches. What are your thoughts here, Mike? We live in a democracy. And yes, the, the average bureaucracy in most states and most governments is heavily progressive and is pushing these ideas. The Productivity Commission sitting in its little ivory tower is a perfect example. But in the end, our politicians get elected by us. And the way that we can respond to bureaucratic overreach in these cases is by lots of us speaking to our local politician and saying, this is what I'm concerned about. And I think the example in New South Wales does show that it can work. We flex our muscles, don't we, at the ballot box. But in some sense, uh, what we do at the ballot box depends on what sort of things we are informing ourselves about and becoming aware of the situations and becoming yep. aware of a biblical view of how you might be able to maintain freedoms. Any thoughts here? Because this connection between our faith and where our nation will be in five, ten years from now, this is very important for listeners to our conversation, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I have got far many thoughts on this issue than we're going to be able to fit into this period of time. But um, very simply, it, may, it is actually a good Christian thing for us to be engaged in our government and speaking to our government. Uh, Paul spoke to the leaders of, the, uh, of um, the Roman Empire as he met with them, and he called them to be obedient. Uh, we, we've got good examples throughout the Old and New Testament of us standing up and speaking out for not just the truth of the, the simple gospel of Jesus died for us and loves us, but the truth of how God made this world and how living this way is actually better for society. Great example. So don't think that it's a bad thing to get involved in government. Uh, what we need to do is to do it lovingly, uh, gently, uh, but yet firmly. Lovingly, gently, firmly. Uh, our talkback line open, one 316 316 to participate in our conversation today. Let's come back to the bill that is before the New South Wales Parliament. Uh, let's talk religious protections for churches and schools here. Um, this is just one of the uh, big, big issues that are in this bill. Uh, how do we start to unpack that a little? Yeah, so I'd say there would be five big headings in the bill of our concerns. But under the religious protection, uh, at the moment, in New South Wales and most of Australia, it is allowed for a faith-based organisation to, to choose to employ people who uphold that faith. And not just people who say they believe that faith or say that they turned up to church once or twice in the year, but you can, you can actually consider their lives and ask, are they living out their faith? And that includes in matters of marriage and sexuality and gender. And that a faith-based organization can say, this is what we believe about the nature of sexuality. Uh, you are clearly not living that life. Uh, so we feel like you are not reflecting our faith. These are the sorts of protections that would be stripped away by Alex Greenwich's Equality Bill. When we talk anti-discrimination, uh, there's an anti-discrimination act uh, that is you know, front and centre in focus here. Uh, yes. The thought that churches get to teach their own doctrines on gender and sexuality and, uh, as you say, the preferential ability to be able to hire people who uphold the faith uh, foundations of that particular institution. Uh, yeah. The church has had this opportunity to have some exemptions. Is it the case that those exemptions are... Uh, there's a, they're seeking to take those exemptions away and therefore uh, take away the Christian elements of Christian schools, even taking away the Christian elements of Christian churches. Uh, that's why this is very important. 
Yes, um, th th that's basically what is happening. Uh, it, it doesn't reach quite into uh, whether a minister can be a Christian or not, uh, but uh, it, uh, in a lot of roles, in a lot of faith-based institutions, uh, the ability to choose somebody based on faith would be removed by these exemptions. And to give you an analogy, uh, if I worked for a political party, if I worked for the Labour Party, and um, then on my on my you know, day off, I sent a whole lot of tweets supporting Peter Dutton and Scott Morrison and saying what wonderful people they are, I could expect to come back the next day and be looking for a new job. It's fine for political parties to look at what you've said and done and how you live outside of your work time and say, no, you don't fit with what, I, or with what we believe. It's fine if I turned up to a job at the conservation society driving a massive hummer with i love coal as a bumper sticker i'm going to be asked to move on as well and so it makes sense that faith institutions should be expecting people to live out their faith if they're if they're part of what we're doing in simple ways of talking about that we might even ask what is it that makes a christian school christian and yes. you could you could argue around curriculum and uh, what sort of books they're called to read but Ultimately, it comes down to the sort of people who are teaching the students uh, whether they hold to the faith that they're called to uphold. Um, any thoughts here around what it is that makes a Christian school Christian? Well, as it just so happens, I took a tour of an independent Christian school yesterday uh, for, for my own child. And um, shout out to Shire Christian School there. And it is quite notable that it's a school whose staff are entirely Christian and you can just feel it in the culture that these are people who know just love the kids. Teachers in most schools love the kids, but they love the kids through Jesus. And it does make a really significant difference to the culture of a school and its ability to be a Christian school. And so the thought that teachers would not either teach in a, you know, the verbal way, delivering curriculum, um, according to their values, which might not be Christian, this is, this is the big, big thing, isn't it? Uh, teachers who would teach, you hope that their faith uh, would be aligned with the school's faith and not contrary to it, because uh, it's one thing to say something, it's another thing to live out values. So we want our teachers to be able to live the values that they say they believe and that they sign up to when they teach in a Christian school. Absolutely. If you remember your favourite teacher from school, you don't remember the specific um, information that they taught you. you. They were a role model. You remember how they were, how they responded to you, how they lived, how passionate they were about their subject. And a, a teacher's Christian faith is, is central um, to being able to be a Christian teacher in a Christian school. But more than that, uh, remember the engagements you had with the office as a student and with everybody else who makes the school work. It is that there are many school communities who want to be able to create a full Christian community. And so it's essential that not just the teachers, but the office staff and everyone who makes the school work upholds and lives out this faith. Well, this is what's happening right now in New South Wales, where this bill that is before the New South Wales Parliament uh, there's been a delay on debate from yesterday, but there is a date in the diary, the 14th of March, to vote on this bill. Uh, it's significant, and we're going to continue to talk some more about the provisions in there. Mike, let's talk about some of the other provisions. We started talking about schools and their ability to employ people whose faith aligns with the school's values. Uh, these other issues, and I named five of those, the five planks, you might say, the things that you're focusing on, and we might go through these fairly quickly, but allowing people 16 and over to change their sex on their birth certificate at any time. Uh, what's so sinister about that? Well, um, we've, we've come up with a bit of an agreement in our society that there's a difference between sex and gender. That sex is your biology, how you're born, your X, your Y chromosomes. Your gender is how you feel about it. And so recently we've all we've had this social understanding that some people want to live out a different gender to their biological sex. However, when we actually make distinctions 
we wanted to do it based on sex. When we have women's gyms, we want it to be for women. When we've got single sex schools or bathrooms or prisons, there are whole lots of situations where we need to be able to say, no, this is your sex. You are actually a male. You go and you be part of these male things. So if you can change your birth certificate and say, no, I'm a completely different sex, then that, that erases any ability. So the bill that Alex Grinch has put forward simply requires a statutory declaration. I put in a piece of paper, now I'm a woman. Now it is illegal for women's only gyms to say, no, you're a guy, don't come in. It doesn't require any surgery. It doesn't require any other changes. So from 16 up, you can imagine a 16-year-old boy realizing, I can put in a piece of paper and now I'm a girl. Well, it's you interesting. Can imagine the implications. Yes, the implications are huge, and I'm just reflecting back. And I only caught a few words during the news there, where it's. And I'm not sure whether you caught that uh, while the news was on uh, there, uh, Mike. But in Canada, uh, it looks as though uh, there's some common sense coming into. Uh, because they're, in fact, uh, considered, you know, way, way more progressive than anybody in Canada. But uh, they're even seeing that they have to put some sort of stops on some of these uh, progressive provisions, uh, lest there's chaos in the country. And any thoughts there? Is there a, is there any pro- you know, a comparison between Canada and Australia? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's the country, apart from New Zealand, it's the other country where most more easiest to compare us to. Uh and there across the world, a number of these very progressive campaigns, either on gender transition or on sex self ID, are starting to get questioned and wound back by governments. The perfect example happened in Scotland when a, a man who had been convicted as a man as a sex offender then changed his sex to be woman and he was put into initially into a women's prison. Now, the Scottish government had to backpedal massively, but there was no cons- they still allow um, sex self-ID, but they've just given no explanation about why, why this person doesn't get to do that. So there's a whole lot of contradictions in the worldview that underlies this sort of thing, which are starting to be found by governments around the world. Yeah. Let's go back to women, uh, because Mm. we said a little earlier, we'll expound on this a little bit more, but women are the biggest losers uh, when all of these legislations come before our parliaments. If they pass through, uh, as you say, you know, where there are particular spaces where women can feel safe, uh, those are under threat. Uh, For every woman listening right now, they'd be listening extra carefully because uh, if you're a woman or if you have children and some of those are girls, uh, you'd be particularly interested in where things are going in Australia. Uh, Women, the biggest losers. And and sometimes you think, is that an overstatement? What are your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. With this entire law, all the changes, women are um, absolutely the biggest losers in this. Uh, it's, It's hard to see how they looked at this legislation that Alex Greenwich and his um, allies looked at this legislation and thought this is a good thing to bring forward. Let's move on. Uh, Children and their ability to bypass their parents to get medical Mm. treatment. And uh, anyone you talk to will say things are changing in the school classroom, in the school playground. Uh, Kids are not as defined as they were before and so you've got this upswing haven't you children and their ability to bypass their parents Uh, thoughts here Uh, parents uh, it's a core part of society that of the the family it looks after the children the parents have responsibility for the children and uh, everything that bypasses that has to be done very very carefully and should be of great concern but On this issue in particular, what the legislation is allowing is, so normally we would say that somebody has got the mental responsibility and capability to consent to surgery and major medical um, treatment when they're 18. And until then, you need to rely on an adult and we need to rely on your parents to make those decisions for you. This legislation says, no, you've got full ability to consent from 16 up. You can imagine the average 16-year-old and how I remember how confused and mostly angry I was at that point in time and think, no, we're going to allow you to make all your medical decisions. 
The bill goes further and says that a child under 16 would be allowed to consent to their own practices and bypass their parents if all it would take is a medical practitioner who would sign a document saying, I think this child is capable of making those decisions and I think it's in their best interests. Let's focus on the doctor there for a few moments. As you say, Mm. uh, a lot then depends on the doctor. But if you're that child and you are looking to pursue something outside of your parental oversight, uh, you're going to hunt down the doctor that's going to give you the sort of response that you're looking for, aren't you? Totally. uh, and and, and I'll t- your thoughts on that for just a moment? Well, totally. And, and we know that the vast, vast, vast majority of doctors are very responsible people. But we know that in every field there are activists. And the Tavistock situation in the UK gives us a perfect example of a small group of activist doctors caught doing significant harm. And to be able to give just an individual doctor without any other oversight the ability to override a parent's rights just at their say-so, is extraordinary authority to give. And then the next question comes, how long then before doctors are then uh, uh, coerced uh, into giving the treatment according to the legislation? Because you set the legislation, you reset the values, and everybody adjusts to those. So uh, doctors, even though they might know what they're doing is wrong, they'll be compelled, won't they, by legislation to, uh, to toe the line. I, I wouldn't want to give anybody the moral challenge of asking, should I be overriding this child's parents to make this decision? A 13-year-old girl says, I want to have a double mastectomy before I even start growing breasts, and I'm the one who has to decide whether that's the right thing to do. I don't think it's even fair on the doctors to give them this kind of, put them in this kind of position. Let's move through these five planks that you've identified as being very, very serious in this legislation that is to be debated in the New South Wales Parliament, removing restrictions on prostitution. Uh, What is that going to mean from the provisions in this bill? Well, there's a section of law um, in the Summary Offences Act, which just lists a bunch of offences in regards to prostitution. Uh, Some of them include um, soliciting uh, for an act of prostitution in or outside a place of worship, Um, public acts of prostitution. Uh, Some of the really interesting ones are uh, coercing a woman into prostitution is one of these criminal offences, and living off the proceeds of prostitution, that is being a pimp. All of these summary offences are just deleted in Alex Greenwich's legislation. He takes the entire section on prostitution and just says, omit. So, not against the law, not illegal. In fact, if you don't have something listed that limits the capacity of people around those things, it's almost like an encouragement to prostitution. Is Can you interpret it that way? Oh, you can, because he goes on further, and he, um, in another part, he wants to elevate prostitution as a protected category. That is, in when you cannot discriminate people based on their protected categories, you cannot discriminate on, against somebody based on their race, you cannot uh, discriminate against somebody based on their sex, and now he wants specific legislation which says you cannot discriminate on something somebody based on their employment as a sex worker. That would be the only job in all of New South Wales that is protected under the anti-discrimination law against being discriminated against. He does want to elevate prostitution as a special protected class and category of employment. And so just in case anyone missed what you have been saying here, uh, while you've got this special category for uh, prostitution, it includes even the ability to solicit Uh, for prostitution outside of a school or a place of worship. Uh, When you've got that sort of provision, uh, if you don't see that there's some threat there, then you must be blind Freddy. I mean, this uh, this is almost unbelievable, but it's in the bill that the New South Wales Parliament will be debating. Absolutely. And it's just bad for women. Like, there is... There is the celebrated class of top one or two or whatever percent of prostitutes who are making lots of money and are all very happy. But the reality is the average sex worker in Australia is coming from an extraordinarily disadvantaged background, 
doesn't have any other options and removing other restrictions around literally removing a restriction from coercing a woman into prostitution. How can this be a good thing? And it could be a reminder for listeners, if you're wondering biblical foundations around prostitution, I always encourage people to go to those early chapters in Proverbs uh, where there is very, very deep insight around uh, the ways that prostitution are are quite uh, significantly damaging to uh, the person who uh, participates. Hey, the other one is legalizing and supporting commercial surrogacy. Uh, mm. What's so significant about this? Again, the um, so surrogacy, I'm um, bearing somebody else's child. That, that's a thing that sometimes happens. Commercial surrogacy starts creating an environment where, again, women in incredibly disadvantaged situations will be financially pressured to be bearing these children. And especially the legislation that Alex Greenwich has put up allows and encourages uh, overseas commercial surrogacy uh, activities, which would mean going to uh, Cambodia, finding a woman who is going to be the surrogate for your baby, paying her to bear your baby, and then taking that baby, bringing it back to Australia, and having all the paperwork sorted that so that you're now the parents. Again, you can see this is this is just using the most disadvantaged people, especially women, for your own benefit. As a friend of mine said, between prostitution and surrogacy, as a female woman, she was she said, between prostitution and surrogacy, is there any part of my body that Axe Greenwich isn't trying to commercialise? It's an exploitation uh, that in any right-mindedness you might even describe as sexist and even racist uh, when you've got those sorts of provisions of people being exploited uh, outside of uh, our own shores. Uh, yeah. When we talk about um, the dignity of women here, uh, this is one of those, again, uh, women the biggest losers when it comes to surrogacy. Some will say, oh, isn't it my right to exploit my own body for a commercial purpose. But uh, your thoughts here around the dignity of women and of families and of what those things that might hold, uh, you know, families together into the future. Thoughts from you on that one, Mike? Uh, again, this is this is a massive issue that uh, the Bible has got so much to say on and the church has been thinking about thoroughly on for 2,000 years. But the way that God has made our biology and our families, uh, is it, it works best for not just the individual, but for society. Uh, in all sorts of areas, we find that when we start to commercialise our inner nature, our being, the fund fundamental parts of who we are, it just goes badly. So um, we, we do want to be, it's a little protectionist, yes, but we want to be able to protect the most vulnerable people, especially most vulnerable women, from being coerced because they feel like they don't have any other option. Let's actually legally not only prevent surrogacy and prostitution and things like that, but also ensure that there are no women in Australia who feel like they don't have any other option. Well, that's the five significant planks that you're saying in this legislation in New South Wales, that is before the New South Wales Parliament, that listeners today need to be particularly concerned about concerned mm. enough to take action. But let's take it even a step deeper because from what I understand, uh, there are some other things in this bill, uh, the eradication of sex-based language and distinctions uh, in the New South Wales statute books. Um, thoughts here because, you know, you change the language, you change the culture, and this is a part of it as well. Again, yes, there's, there's this... Um, changing of the language in the statute book in Alex Greenwich's legislation, which just removes the concept of male and female entirely. And so even in places where the law would have said a person of the opposite sex, it's now being changed to a person of a different sex. And it's just changing it to removing this fundamentally, scientifically, biological separate uh, difference, which is male and female, with a 0.001% of, yes, there is there are some sex divergence. Uh, it's just, for example, one of the issues they could come up with, 
Um, one, parts of the legislation that are changed are bits which cover um, security and prisons and airports where body searches are done. Now, of course, a body search should be done by a security person or a police officer of the same sex as the person that they're searching. But now, what if sex isn't a real concept? What if sex is something that you can change on a piece of paper? The legislation that Alex Greenwich is proposing effectively means that I get to choose. I'm going to get searched. I get to choose not only the category of person who's searching me, but the person who's going to search me. And so my rights to be searched by whoever I want gets um, set up. However, what about the rights of the person searching? A Muslim police officer, female police officer who can only search and touch women, and that's, that's just part of um, her faith, is now told by this big burly guy who's got a piece of paper that he's a female, you're the one doing my body search. It, the way that changing um, the legislation, it doesn't just protect the rights of the individual, it forces everybody else around to be shifting how they act and it violates their rights at the same time. So if legislation like this, and uh, you know, it may go through as it is at present, there may be some amendments, as you say, the opposition, uh, they may well introduce some sort of amendments, whether they can get through or not, who knows. The upshot of if legislation like this passes in New South Wales and whatever is similar in Victoria or in Queensland or Western Australia, South Australia, Tasmania, in the territories, if legislation passes through, Mike, it becomes then entrenched entrenched into law and that changes everything. Uh, This is why people need to be preparing right now to not make 2024 a year of just uh, you know, wading through 2024 and letting uh, what will be will be, but actually taking some action here. Uh, let me ask you about the sort of action that you would like to see listeners right now listening to our conversation, simple things they can do, more complex things they can do. What do we do here, Mike? Yeah, well, first thing, it's what you said. Um, the, gov- the opposition managing to get a grudging amendment or two is not the best option we're looking for. There is a very real chance that the New South Wales government looks at this bill and just says no. And that is the target we're going for. We want the New South Wales Labor government to reject this bill. It's not their bill. It's some independent MP who's brought it up. Reject this bill. So what can we do to be encouraging the government and the opposition to be rejecting it? We need to tell them that that's what we want them to do. The most valuable and effective way of communicating with your MP is to write to them. Not a form letter, not a petition, write your own email, even better, write it on a piece of paper and put it on those square stamp things on it and post in the old fashioned mail. And write to your MP and say, I am worried about this, reject this bill. And you can find everything you need to all the talking points, all the information to find your MP on our website, contactyourmp.org.au. Because as I talk to MPs across New South Wales and across Australia, when people have been writing letters to them, they notice it and they say it to me. They say, wow, I've been getting the letters. I'm hearing. We're hearing. And the more letters that come, the more pressure they feel and the more they realize that the people in their electorate the people who will be voting for them in a few years' time are worried about this and want them to do something. So I cannot under I cannot overemphasize the value and importance of just right to your MP. So if there's a takeaway from such a serious and detailed conversation, it is just right to your MP. Uh, let me give the connection points here. And there might be some encouragement or some resource that you can rely on. The Freedom for Faith website is freedomforfaith.org.au and you will find on that website links to contact MPs. In fact, there is a website, contactyourmp.org.au, connected to Freedom for Faith, that will enable you to do that easily. Now, Freedom for Faith, you'll be able to subscribe to get a regular update. And as you can hear, Mike, as he so beautifully and comfortably articulates the real 
uh, dangers of what is ahead with this sort of legislation, you might want to subscribe for a regular update from Freedom for Faith. Just go to the freedomforfaith.org.au website. Mike Southon, Executive Director for Freedom for Faith. Mike, uh, let's do this again soon because there's lots of dimensions still to cover, but uh, appreciate your insights so much today on 2020. Thank you. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.